So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Neil Marshall, and I'm the webinar for today's uh, session on demystifying food risk predictions for, far, for large food manufacturers, and also some details around the case for ETO. So today we're going to have a, a nice discussion uh, with uh, two esteemed colleagues with myself, and I'm just going to take you through some background information before we get to the meat of the webinar. So in this digital era, AI and big data are dominating the conversation. There's hundreds of systems from robots to advanced software platforms to virtual reality devices that are all aiming to improve food manufacturing. Changes are already taking place at many large manufacturers where major digital transformation projects were already well underway. It's a change that will eventually affect everyone in the industry, whether you're a tech enthusiast, a tech pragmatist, or very conservative about technology. The food safety landscape continues to become more and more digital. And of course, with that, this brings a lot of pressure on us food safety professionals who need to either upskill or learn how to get the most from this technology. It's a constant challenge. So if I think back to my days at Coca-Cola, uh, 18 months or so now, I guess, for me, digital technology and suppliers were always trying to knock on my door, trying to sell me solutions and convince me of the benefits of their IT, their solution or their platform. But they often didn't understand the challenges of the problem they needed to solve for me. Because as I always used to say, what is the problem you're trying to solve? and then you give me a solution. So to begin that successful transition, we need uh, to move towards digital transformation. I knew we had to evaluate, adopt, and deploy the right suite of tools to make our lives easier and to make the job easier and make the production safer. But we also had to quickly understand the hidden meaning behind some of these buzz buzzwords that have been around in the industry for a while now, like blockchain, big data and predictive analytics. And that was really the first critical step to understand the language, the lingo and the terminology. So we have a profession that's full of critical decisions. We have lots of challenges. We have things to resolve and, and debate and discuss all the time because the industry uh, is full of ambiguity, of uncertainty, shades of gray, and digital technologies can help us play a critical role in improving and assessing those risks to make better decisions. So when I was still working at Coke, we often had to consider the different data dimensions and aspects continuously because of the amount of production and volume and change in, in the landscape. For example, deciding how the organization should react to emerging risks or defining a strategic technical framework to help and minimize future incidents. But ensuring that product integrity for the beverages, which were obviously delivered to millions and billions of customers, whilst also protecting the brand and the reputation of the company from maybe defective ingredients or suppliers who didn't follow all the processes, was obviously very critical, important, and gave me a lot of fun as well as, as part of my role. So, nice robot picture there for us. Uh, what can AI and predictive analytics do for people like us and for the food industry? Or should we invest in this sometimes quite expensive technology and change the way that we and our teams take decisions? A lot of people say, you know, how reliable are these models, the AI models, and what kind of food risks can they really predict? And there's a lot of discussion and debate about that. And I'm sure Yanis has come on to tell us more in the future of this uh, webinar and explain a little bit more. But one of the things that I'm, I guess, often asked is what are the real life examples from industry? Have they really saved time? And how can you, you know, deploy those using the predictive analytics to get improved results? So today I want to help us to delve a little deeper into this question 
So we set up this webinar with my friends from AgriNow so we could pose these questions and hopefully get some of the right answers, which I'm sure we will. So with that, we come to our uh, esteemed panel. You can see on the right, uh, sorry, the left, that's myself, Neil Marshall. I now run my own consulting business, my ex Coca-Cola. Uh, in the center, we have Nikos, the CEO of Agnano, and also Yanis, the CTO and co-founder of Agno. So in this session, we'll try to demystify the food risk predictions and illustrate some practical ways in which they can be used to enhance decisions around food safety for food safety quality professionals uh, in large food manufacturers. So I asked the two people that I consider are world-class and superbly qualified to talk about this topic, Nikos Manasuelis and Yanis Stotis, sometimes known as John, from Agrino. As I said previously, Nikos is the founder and CEO of Agrino, the food safety intelligence company that predicts risks to help inform prevention. Nikos has more than 15 years of expertise in the intersection of data and technology for food and agriculture. And he's frequently working with industry, academia, and international organizations on ways in which state-of-the-art technologies may be used to help solve critical challenges in the food supply chain. Hello, Neil. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Nikos. Welcome to the video. Yanis is uh, also the business partner and CTO of Agrino, the food safety intelligence company that predicts risk to help inform prevention. And he is the uh, creator of Food Akai and the platform, which we're going to also review today. Uh, the Food Akai platform has been uh, described by many people as the Ferrari of the food risk intelligence solutions. And it has been used by many global manufacturers now, like the Coca-Cola Company, Conagra, Yearly Group, and Unilever, amongst others. So we talked about definitions. I mentioned AI, big data, and these things already. What is artificial intelligence? So with that, let's open the debate and open the discussion. I'm here for the demystification part. Eh? You're here for the demystification. <laughs> to put a bit uh, the mystery out of the world. And, um, I like going back to the definitions when doing this. Uh, so thanks, thanks, Neil, for the intro. You're welcome. Um, and when I go back to the definitions, I go back to the dictionary definitions that uh, help us understand what does a specific phrase mean, not forgetting that there is a, a lots of science behind it. So Merriam-Webster defines AI as a branch of computer science, particularly focusing on simulating intelligent behavior. And if you wonder what does this mean, what does intelligent behavior uh, mean, it practically means the capability of a, of a system, a machine, a device to imitate what one would call intelligent human behavior. That's the, the famous Turing test, that you are behind a door or a wall and you don't know if you're interacting with a system or uh, with a human. So what exactly is this intelligent human behavior? Uh, I went to a second definition to demystify that part. And uh, Britannica gave me uh, some very interesting uh, examples because it talks about the ability of a system, uh, a computer a software system or a, or a device, uh, a robot, to perform specific tasks. Tasks that you would uh, associate and link to an intelligent being or to follow and execute a process that has some intellectual characteristics of humans. So very typical examples are the ability to reason and explain why you propose a specific action or the ability to 
observe many, many different data points and generalize or to go and refer to previous experience so that you can take a next action. And one of my favorite applications that I have uh, spotted uh, a couple of weeks ago is this particular uh, AI powered uh, machine vision solution by a company called uh, Landing and AI. There is the traditional part of image processing that is using a camera and a computer to identify a, a product that has some deficiency or some defaults. So this is something that employs lots of complex uh, software with no AI up to a point. And then it puts in place, it complements this with machine learning algorithms that are trying to either understand more quickly by generalization or to even predict what is coming up in the flow of products or do other more intelligent things by the enhancement of these AI models. Again, what does this mean? What does adding predictive capabilities to such a, an application mean? It means that there is some kind of model that is trying to imitate intelligent human behavior. And that's exactly the, the backbone upon which uh, I was based to, to develop a working definition of uh, AI or food risk uh, uh, predictions or prevention. How can we define this? Fully based on what we have seen so far. Food risk intelligence or AI refers to systems. So a computer system or other type of, of uh, device that can imitate the intellectual process that a human follows so that a risk can be identified, evaluated, and then prevented. What does this mean, intellectual processes that a human follows? For example, discover the meaning that is hidden in different observations and data sources. What would a human do by observing different things and then try to understand what is the meaning there? What is the risk that I see if I am observing prices going up, the supply breaking down, cl climate conditions changing in an area where my suppliers reside? What do I understand? How can a system mimic? imitate this intellectual process or learning from past experience. What I have seen happening many, many years as an expert when I'm on the profession that Neil and many of you are, how can a system be put in place to imitate this process of using past experience to try to predict something that's coming up? And if we go a bit deeper and we look at the three dimensions that Neil also mentioned, we can even look at the type of process, intellectual process that the food safety professional is following, either when monitoring risks, so scanning, investigating, or identifying and reporting what is happening, outside in the world that is affecting our supply chain. Second, everything that has to do with the way that a human is performing an evaluation, a risk evaluation or assessment or a scoring activity. How do I take different data inputs from the outside world, from my supplier audits, from the ingredients risk that I see uh, emerging or any other types of data inputs so that I can connect them together and calculate the risk associated with an ingredient or a supplier. And then the actual processes that uh, a human expert follows when trying to mitigate or prevent a risk. 
what do I follow as a signal? What do I monitor as a signal in our production environment and or in the outside world that tells me that something is happening? And this should trigger an action from my side. And how can we put in place a system that can actually imitate this intellectual process that I'm following as an expert? So this is the way that I would formulate in a more specific way the areas and the decisions. And if we go to the specific examples, I am, I'm using three uh, well-proven, excellent solutions uh, from the market uh, that are used to uh, support these decisions. Risk monitoring, a widely used and proven system. If we can stay to the previous slide, please. That is reporting on the spot something that is happening, alerting that something was reported and you need to be aware of it, or using all the data so that we can report trends, increasing or decreasing trends that have to do with uh, the incidents. Another system that is using this data and adds the risk calculation uh, layer. How can I use the information about the incidents about an ingredient, a raw material, a product category or a supplier, and put a risk model in place to calculate a score? And then use the score to understand whether there is a higher priority in something I have to do or a lower priority in something I have to do. A third example that goes to the direction of prevention. How can I design my HACCP plan based on hundreds or thousands of similar HACCP plans in the database so that I can appropriately foresee the control points in my process? All these types of software systems are the types of systems that are supporting these critical decision areas. And you will ask me, Nikos, okay, but where can AI add value? So I go back to the challenges. I go back to the, to the shortcomings that we hear from clients and colleagues when these tasks are being executed. I, I will use one example, a typical example. There is an incident that is being announced, if we can stay at the on the previous slide, uh, please. There is an incident that is being announced by an authority. It arrives at my mailbox. It rings a bell because it's similar or close to something that I read a couple of weeks ago, but it's a different announcement. And I'm not so sure, should I investigate it again? Should I spend hours investigating whether this is something that concerns us or not? That's one of the typical shortcomings where we see AI coming and helping, imitating the process that I would follow as a human. So this is exactly the example that I would come and, uh, and dig deeper into. This type of early threat monitoring and identification in which my intellectual process is monitoring as many sources as possible reading and processing as many incident reports as possible and putting together all this information to understand if this is a relevant incident that I should react upon. Or if I see a hazard, an amazing hazard, risk or threat that I should be reacting upon. That's the traditional horizon scanning or surveillance or foresight uh, activities that I would follow. So in this kind of use case, and in this kind of task, where can AI play a role? If we can go to the next slide. Let's see first how we do something like this today. From a survey that we did with 
more than 100 companies in our network. We asked them, how do you perform this kind of task today? More than 60%, almost 65% are doing it manually. There is someone, a person, a dedicated person or a group of people that spend time visiting official or trusted and trusted sources of information. Either a couple of them, like RASAF and the FDA, or many of them. 65% of the companies that participated in the survey, they do it manually. And there is about a 25% that is using a software system. In the majority of cases, uh, a third party service and a few of them developing something in house. But not in all cases, this is a hot software system that has intelligence in it. So, what we see in the market is that there is still a way ahead until we come to more intelligent systems for exactly this kind of threat risk monitoring and identification. So how does intelligence look like? What is exactly the way in which we should expect in the future AI to come and not only help us automate tasks, but even imitate the thought process, the intellectual process that the food expert follows? I have some examples to share. This is the example that I started with trying to extract, extract meaning from lots and lots and lots of data, lots and lots and lots of incident reports. This is the case where there is an event that something has been recalled because salmonella was found. It is announced in different ways, in different formats, in different languages, in, with different types of content in many, many authorities around the world. And someone has to sit down, read all these announcements, aggregate them in something that makes sense and refers to this particular case. Try to understand and extract whether there is a specific supplier that we can link to this incident. And if there are any relevant suppliers that are also affected or associated. What is the particular product category or ingredient category or specific ingredient that is affected? And what is exactly the hazard or even serotype of hazard that led to this incident? All this process that we take for a human hours to perform by putting in place an intelligent software system, we can make it faster and we can make it even more extensive and give something to the human decision maker that has already saved lots and lots of time. Another example, forecasting what will come next. taking advantage of all the historical data that come in a time period. In this case, the numbers of incidents for a particular product category and how they have been historically going and identifying the way in which they either increase or decrease and build a model, in this case, a time series based forecasting model that can tell us what is the estimated number of incidents in the weeks to come or in the months to come. A different approach, a different model for a process that you could approximate as an expert, but when a system comes and puts in place some technology, it becomes even more specific and gives you an estimate that you can work with. And a third example, trying to calculate 
estimate the likelihood of a new risk to increase, to come up or increase or decrease. How can you incorporate in a model the different signals that you would take into consideration from the market as an expert that would lead to you suggesting, for example, to your team that I feel that we have increased likelihood for this particular risk to come uh, and hit us. I'm not so sure, but I, I estimate that the, the likelihood is higher during this period and we have to do something. And how can we put a model in place that will do this calculation for us and come with an estimation of this uh, likelihood and can provide this as an output? These are different examples of different thought intellectual processes where we are trying to put a model with some relevant data in place to imitate the human process, the human behavior, to imitate and make it quicker because such a system is a hard worker and can work efficiently, tirelessly, process lots and lots of data that will take us lots of hours to, or days to process. In many cases, more extensive, especially if it tries, if it starts incorporating and processing thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of data points and information that is coming in different languages and combining them so that it can provide an outcome. And it gives something that is proven to be reliable, some, some results that the model, by the way that you train it and you test it, you see that it would predict good things in the past. So everything here comes with these components being very, very important. The problem that we're trying to solve, the process that we are trying to imitate, what kind of model should we put in place and how should we train the model so that we get reliable and accurate results. The specific examples, I will leave them to Yanis to, to explain. What I would like us to think about right now is what would be the decisions or what would be the usage scenarios in which we would put such a technology in practice. So imagine that it's as simple as having this in an app in your phone, like we have it in weather prediction. What is exactly the task in which you could put this technology in practice? What would be the process that you already follow now that you would like it? to support? With what kind of data would you feed it? What is the outcome that you would expect? This is a very crucial step down the road of taking advantage of these technologies. Neil, I'm taking a break here. <laughs> You've been talking for a while there, yeah, so you need a break. Yeah, but I, I think there's a few questions and comments in the chat already about the accuracy of the data and the confidence level of the data, but I think we'll come on to that as well later. But can AI really predict the next recall before it happens, Nikos? That's the difficult question for you. It's good for me. I like to ask difficult questions. I don't have to answer them for a change. I've written a, an article uh, with this title, eh? if AI can help us predict the, the next recall. If you're asking me if there is a magic uh, black box or a digital crystal ball that out of the blue will tell us next week when, where exactly and uh, when exactly uh, the next incident will happen? My answer is no, at least not yet. What we can do with this technology is that we can go and think about the way that you would estimate something like this yourself. So 
how do you decide how when, when if if you go back to the days of you being in uh, in such a position what kind of signals did you take into consideration so that you can take this decision that something nasty is going to happen the usual ones that everybody looks for, the consumer right. complaints, the recalls, the industry information, the scans of the horizon, you know, whatever you could pick up, trade associations, etc. That's the same inputs everyone's looking for uh, to use to base, base our import. So that's exactly the way that I would approach it, that if we can take these information sources that you would consider, and as an expert, reason, generalize, base, uh, your thought process on past experience and then arrive to an estimate of the likelihood of something coming up. Can we create a model that will replicate this and imitate this? Yes, we can do this. But if we can build a, a huge model that will take everything as input and will produce the perfect answer as a result, no. Sure. Okay, I think we need to move to uh, our friend Yanis now to keep to the timeline. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Nikos, for the mystifying uh, the AI, the prediction. So hello to all. It's great to have you all in this webinar. Uh, I will share uh, some experiences from uh, working with several companies and trying to, to put AI in practice. Uh, so I would like to share the most important things that we have learned so far. We have identified, uh, as Nico Scholder as you mentioned, and, uh, and uh, Neil at the beginning of this presentation, of this webinar, we have identified three critical scenarios in which AI can add value. Uh, in this presentation, these slides, I, I would like to share which are the most critical decision scenarios that can support uh, the food companies to take uh, very important decisions uh, that they have in every day. So the first scenario has to do with uh, the ingredient risks. It's about calculating the risk that is associated with all the key ingredients in the short term, in the, which is today, in the mid term, uh, next weeks or in the next month, and in the long term and uh, next years. The second type and the second uh, scenario for decision support uh, has to do with suppliers' risks. So this is about using ingredient risk and other important indicators to calculate uh, the risk uh, and to calculate uh, the a ranking, a risk ranking, uh, and being able also in some cases to incorporate predictions. And the third scenario is the one that has to do with risk mitigation and risk prevention. And this is about moving towards a more proactive decision-making process. So for these three, three scenarios, I would like to share some experience with you from putting in place AI. So how do we analyze each scenario? By focusing, first of all, by focusing on the business question. For us, it's very important to understand the, the business question. And after understanding the business question, the next very critical step is to select the right data, to identify which data we can use to answer this question, and then which prediction method. As you all hear and you read, there are several methods, but it's always very important to select the prediction methods that fits well uh, to the type, to the nature of the uh, business question, to the nature of the problem that we need to solve. Is this a classification problem? Is this a forecasting problem? Should I use uh, machine le le learning methods like decision tree or a regression, simple regression, or should I use deep learning? All these are questions that you can answer if you understand and if you uh, know which type of the method, which method fits well to the type of the question that we need to answer. 
And then we need, of course, to train the model that we will develop and to test the model so we can deliver uh, an accurate uh, prediction uh, to the people that they need to take the critical decisions. But uh, this webinar has promised also a very specific use case. So uh, a very known uh, issue uh, during the last months, which is the ethylene oxide case. So I would like to walk you through a real life use case, uh, which is about the decisions within a client that manufactures snacks products, uh, in which uh, sesame is one of the uh, main ingredients, in, uh, together with other ingredients like uh, grain and spices. Uh, so this client, used uh, for his products, he used a system like Kudakai to continuously monitor all the risks for all the ingredients. And this is how he managed to identify early uh, an increasing risk for ETO in sesame seeds. And using all the calculations, the dynamic calculations for the risk, the system was able to highlight to the uh, client that there will be an important increase by 400% of the risk for a chemical contaminant like ETO in sesame seeds. Using this information, the client performed uh, a data-informed hazard analysis for the sesame. This means that he used, he was able to use all the information about the previous incidents, previous recalls, border rejections, uh, historically going back more than 20 years. So he, he could identify if such a chemical hazard uh, has affected before uh, the sesame, uh, an ingredient like sesame, and which is the hazard profile based on so on the specific regions from which you can source the sesame and of course he focused there on the regions uh, that he was sourcing the sesame in order to identify which are the hazards so in the short term he had the monitoring uh, and he had all the data the historical data for the hazards uh, so far he was also able to use large uh, data sets like the residues monitoring programs for from 34 countries uh, in order to identify if ethylene oxide has been previously identified in the lab tests uh, for, for in all the, in all these monitoring pro, uh, programs and uh, uh, indeed uh, there were there were several cases several samples in which uh, the ETO has exceeded the official limits or was close to the, to the official limits. Uh, and it was definitely identified during the lab tests. And this was even three years before the incidents. So he knew at that point that uh, this is not a very new issue, that this is something that he needs to pay it, that uh, needs action. He used also the predictive analytics to identify which is the emerging threat uh, for uh, about the sesame of ETO, specifically in the sesame. So the system highlighted that there will be an increase in this specific uh, hazard, a very important increase in this specific hazard. Uh, so he was all, also able to see uh, some weeks and some months uh, ahead and to identify which uh, should be the next action and if he needs to take preventive measures to, to manage this issue. But when actually ETO in sesame seeds uh, first emerged, so uh, you probably all know that this was something that was initially announced by some uh, uh, by uh, RASAF and then by some authorities, but some local authorities. And it, this was at the beginning of uh, September 2020. And this indeed emerged very fast. 
as you can see in this diagram, starting from September on October, November, we had already a very massive uh, amount of incidents that are, have, been, have been reported. And of course, this changed very much uh, the profile, the risk profile of sesame, of uh, ETO in sesame seeds. But was it really a new issue? Was it all a new issue for the industry? So if we can go to the next slide, our data says no, clearly no. This was not a new, new issue. This was something that the uh, client identified uh, using historical data that uh, this was an issue that was reported even from 2008, then in 2011, 2015, 2018, 2019. And uh, the last uh, two years, it was uh, reported also for uh, things coming from the specific region, from, from India. So this was not an, a new issue. And uh, the client had the data to justify that this is something that was there and it's emerging now. And uh, this, is also, this was also a known issue in the food uh, safety research. So there were early uh, uh, studies and publications that uh, were reporting this kind of uh, issues in the industry and that there is a need to pay some more attention to that. And this is one example of such publication, but there are several publications that were uh, reporting that. So using all this information at the ingredient uh, level and the ingredients level, and uh, we are talking here for sesame seed, but of course, uh, coming from uh, for the specific regions, there are several other ingredients that may be relevant, like herbs and spices, and then later on there were other ingredients that were affected. But using all this information, he was sure, the client was sure that he needs to take some preventive measures. And let's see what he, he did also for his uh, suppliers. So for the suppliers, client used, our client used continuously uh, the, the monitoring uh, part. So he was able to continuously monitor all his suppliers from the specific region. Uh, and he was also able to check uh, suppliers from alternative regions, from other regions. So he can, for some uh, period, he, he, uh, he was thinking to change even the region of uh, sourcing this kind of uh, ingredients. And uh, this kind of monitoring and the supplier check was very helpful for him. And then he was also uh using the predictive analytics to see which suppliers will be affected uh, by this uh, increasing issue of ETO in sesame, uh, sesame seeds and how this uh, this issue will also uh, change the risk profile of this supplier so the system using the information of the predicted uh, of, the, of, of this increase of the hazard of the ETO hazard highlighted to the client that the risk profile of these suppliers has changed. Uh, so he was able to start thinking about preventive measures or about alternative, uh, alternative regions for sourcing the specific ingredient. And uh, he was able, uh, using all this information uh, for ingredients, but also other external uh, factors like inspections, like uh, warning letters, combine it with predictions, uh, but also combine it with uh, his internal data about uh, quality compliance, about audit scores. Uh, so in this, Combining this different and heterogeneous data, he was able to have a dynamic, a real-time risk scoring and ranking for all his supplier, suppliers in his supply chain. And by ranking the supplier, he was able to identify which are the suppliers that are at uh, high risk. So, for instance, the supplier uh, that uh, uh, he had for uh, sesame. Uh, was at high risk. 
so he needed to take uh, an action about that. And uh, after all this analysis, having all this analysis uh, for the predicted uh, trends for the historical the historical information, but also all uh, the dynamic risk ranking and risk assessment of the suppliers, uh, he increased the sampling the sampling frequency uh, of all the sesame seed that was supplied by the specific region because he managed also to do this analysis for the specific region and he explored also alternative sourcing uh, locations uh, for the specific ingredient so this helped him very much to take timely the preventive measures and after a few months uh, by studying uh, the predicted ETO incidence in sesame seeds, he uh, realized that it, will, it was predicted that this will significantly decrease. And uh, he again reduced, he decreased the test sampling frequency and the sourcing of the ingredient, of the specific ingredient from media has been restored. So he got back to the previous situation. So which are the learnings from this specific use case? First, for the ingredient risk, uh, what we have learned uh, is that the daily monitoring and the hazard analysis was very useful for the client uh, to see if ETO has previously affected uh, sesame seeds and uh, which is the trend uh, of these issues for specific regions. In the mid term, it was very important that using the large data sets, the client realized that ETO has previously affected several ingredients from specific regions. So it was not a, a new issue. And more further, the predictions helped him to see how the emerging issues will evolve within the next few months, and if he should activate extra preventive measures. For the suppliers uh, scenario, in the short term, we learned that uh, supplier check and the live uh, food safety profile was very helpful to check also alternative suppliers to find a solution for the availability of the, uh, of the ingredient, reducing uh, the, the risk. And we also learned that for the midterm, the client was able to combine heterogeneous data sources and get a real uh, time, a dynamic risk ranking for all his suppliers. And this helped him very much to adjust the lab testing uh, uh, by increasing the sampling frequency for the sesame seeds. So this was very helpful in order to mitigate the risk. And for the risk prevention, scenario, we learned that uh, knowing an increasing trend can really help in taking immediate mitigation action. It also made uh, more frequent and dynamic the process of allocating residue prevention measure measures and also the, the budgets that we are using for that. And yes, what we have learned is that we can become more proactive if we use such uh, a large data sets and we use predictive analytics when they are available in this kind of uh, format. What we also did together with the client is that we uh, quantified which is the business value, which is the return of investment if you want to put in place this kind of uh, technology, what you can get back. And, uh, we did, that, we did that for the three levels, for the three scenarios, for the risk monitoring, for the uh, risk assessment, but also for the prevention. We analyzed all the assessments that he, need, he needed to do, and he needs to do every uh, very frequently to have a dynamic risk assessment approach. Uh, and we end up with savings that are larger than 4 million. Uh, and this has to, uh, to do with savings from the manual monitoring, with savings from the manual assessments, as 
we are showing in these diagrams. In this diagram, sorry, but the most important component of the saving is the preventing, the prevention component. What we can save, save from preventing incidents. And this is how we, we also analyze this for uh, the three years. So we have a journey of the business value for uh, these three dimensions. So there are many points in which we believe that AI can make a difference. At the end of the day, it's very important to, to keep in mind that uh, it is about improving the process, which is the transition that uh, we should make very carefully. Uh, as it happens with any other digitization project, it, it has to be, it has to carefully, we have to carefully consider how it will be introduced into the company. Uh, we need to, to keep in mind that we don't want to distract the way that the things are being done, but we want to improve the workforce. We want to optimize the workforce for the risk prevention. We need a very good and planned approach uh, so that uh, the right people can be allocated and the routines uh, be put in place so this process will be improved. And this is why we are always proposed in uh, for this kind of technologies, we are always proposed uh, an exploratory phase so that the people can understand the potential and how the AI solution can help them to become more proactive. So it's, it's always good to have such a phase. So I think that's where I come back in, Yanis. Thank you for that detailed explanation. Excellent overview and showing the deep dive of the technology and how you help your client there. That's really interesting. So I guess, you know, there's a few comments and questions in the chat, but also I have some questions for you. So some, a quick question. So how safe are these predictions? Everyone's asking about that, you know, the confidence level, how, how confident can we be in the predictions for the future? Can we really trust it? So is there any way you can, I know you've already given an example there, but do you have any examples of how you can explain that a little bit further? Yeah, I would be happy to do so. And uh, indeed, this is something that uh, everyone, uh, even uh, ourselves, uh, we are asking when we see this kind of approaches. So how safe they are, uh, which is the confidence level. So uh, I would say that it's important to know what is feasible with the prediction method that you are working with and the data that we are using. Uh, in our case, uh, we are trying to answer the question of uh, if incidents and hazards will increase within the next few months. So it's, it was about forecasting method. And such a forecasting approach can have a model for a forecasting model can have a very good accuracy. We can trust it, uh, but we need to know that this model are very, very good when you have periodic patterns, whether you want to identify periodic patterns or when you have what we call seasonality, when you want to identify increasing or decreasing trend, or you want to identify anomalies in the data. For, for instance, to identify the extreme case uh, in, in the incidents, in the time series of all the incidents, like the case of ETO that I showed. Uh, for instance, uh, expecting that this will be uh, very good in classification in classifying things into the classification problems is not realistic, so it's not possible. What we are doing to also uh, prove uh, how, which is this, the accuracy of our model, is that we are validating the models both from the accuracy but also from the use cases point of view. So for the accuracy, we are using some specific metrics that estimate the error between the actual and the predicted value, values for a reference period, period. And we are using several known periods to estimate this accuracy. It's not only for a specific period. Eh? So we know that uh, the model in different periods perform, uh, performs well. And if it does not perform well, we are showing this to the people, to the, to the users. So they know that the accuracy there is low. 
And we are also validating the models for historical issues, such, such as the Fibronil case, the ETO case, or even other not so uh, well-known cases, but uh, things that were very important in the industry. So if you know the capabilities of the prediction method and the accuracy for the specific data, uh, yes, the answer is that you can trust the model. Okay, thank you. I think we need to move on because uh, we're close to the time. So yeah, so trying to reflect and wrap up from what we saw there, you know, there's lots of information around the analytics and how we can move forward. I think one thing I just reflect from listening to uh, Yanis there was, you know, there's hints out there already, but probably lots of us are too busy to see the hint. So we don't have time to focus on it because we don't have got a routine process and system for capturing the information. And we need to also then uh, think about that for the future and, and try to use technology more to help us. But I think whether you use uh, the Agrino solution, the Food Akai platform or not, you know, if it was me again and I was back in my old roles, uh, you need to use a similar process to what's described here by Nikos and Yanis. It's a well thought out process, carefully calculated steps. And, and I like it because I've seen several big uh, food manufacturers using this kind of process and usually from a like an introductory pilot and a step uh, like that is a good way to get uh, started on the deployment i think you know excuse the picture there <laughs> i don't really want to look at myself on the screen there too long but some of the pictures are from you know global global brands and big companies need to understand the benefits and use that upside potential for food industry and how they can really use it to help their teams to deploy the technology and really enhancing your risk management framework, um, identifying probably sometimes internally the people, the routines, and how you can improve those decisions in support from the tools. You know, it's, it's not just one thing or the other. The tools are informing you as the as a, a company, as, as excellent professionals to make those decisions. But the deployment of the tools can be hugely beneficial and drive productivity savings uh, for time, money, and avoiding recalls. You know, that's ultimately what we want to do. We're trying to avoid these issues. This is helping us to be better and help to mitigate and prevent crises like I unfortunately went through a few times during my career. Uh, you know, for the last probably five or six years, we've been talking about big data and technology in, in global industry, trade associations, GFSI, et cetera. And we've been trying to promote, and me particularly, promoting the use and deployment of technology to support reducing audits, helping to get better at risk assessment. Um, but some people are more interested and passionate and some are not. But I think we need to keep pushing that and driving uh, the adoption because you know, talking to some of the lot, of, a lot of the big players at the GFSI type board level and, and big multinationals, they're trying to use that now. Many people are adopting these models now. This is the future. This is what you need to do to reduce risk, uh, to improve your food manufacturing processes. I think uh, the next slide, please. I think we can move on now to final uh, discussions. I guess so. I think. We're about at time, so I'd like to really thank Nikos and Yanis and all the participants and any questions we've not missed yet. Maybe we can try and cover something now in the last couple of minutes or so. But you know, if you want to use AI-powered food predictions and risk assessments, what are you and Yanis going to do, and how can how can you help them explain that a little bit more, Yanis, Nikos? Yeah, so we want to give a flavor of how the food risk predictions look like to everyone that watched the, this webinar. And thank you so much for your attention. So by signing up, uh, you will receive a weekly update that includes emerging risk trends and predictions powered by Food Akai. So please use the link to, to sign up. Thank you so much. And it's quite simple. You just indicate uh, three to five ingredient categories or product categories that you want to receive predictions for and then uh, an email will come with uh, specific steps that you can follow to activate this uh, free period of receiving the predictions so do we have time for 
a couple of questions. I think you can, it's up to you. You're, you're in charge ultimately. I'm just moderating your session for you too. I think you had a, the, there was a question that I heard from Hylas around uh, the 20 year anniversary of acrylamide. I think he mentioned that to me. I don't know if you want to answer that, Nikos. I would ask the help of Yanis. Did we see ah, okay. acrylamide after 20 years of historical data? Did we see something like this uh, coming up as a, as a risk in our models? Um, yes, we see we see that there is still an issue with acrylamide, but uh, there is a lot of knowledge for for managing acrylamide in the in the industry because this is something that comes up uh, during the process. And so, uh, I believe that now from now on we will not have so many uh, cases. Uh, so this is not something that the model says that will emerge during the next uh, years. But it, it always depends on how we are managing this in the in the industry, yeah? because it's highly linked to the process itself. I don't know if you there's any more questions that we want to ask, or I guess we're about we're slightly over time, so I'll leave it up to you two. We've got plenty of thanks good, and then. information. Yeah, I think people are happy on the chats. I can just see, I think people are ask a lot of the questions and comments around the accuracy and the confidence level stuff that uh, Yanis has just responded to. So I think we're good. Yeah, and most of the questions I see that they, are, they have been uh, replied so far, but we are open to hear others as well. I think the good point is, as we said to leave with, is to sign up for the free uh, item attached, send in your uh, ingredients and sign up for the freebie. And feel free to reach out to us if you have specific questions that we can uh, look at together. Huh? So we can dive into the live model and see what do we see in terms of predictions and why do does the model predict something? These are things that we can uh, explore together uh, in a scenario that you may have in mind. Absolutely. Okay, thank you everybody for your time. And I think that concludes the webinar for today. Thanks everyone for watching. And it's been interesting for us and we're glad to share any more information. Please use the links attached. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Neil. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye, Yanis. Bye, Nikos. Bye-bye.